Welcome to Chapter 6 in OpenStax Astronomy. In this chapter, we'll be talking about telescopes, both the terms used to describe different types of telescopes, as well as some, some of the innovations in modern telescopes that astronomers currently use. In this particular video, we'll be introducing ourselves to some of the key concepts, and then in the second video, we'll discuss some of the other highlights from this chapter. Now, there's a lot of different reasons why telescopes are important and useful. And to start out with, we do want to remind ourselves that not only are there so many different types of light than what our eyes are able to detect, but that also a lot of those forms of light are blocked by our atmosphere. So in this chapter, we'll be talking not just about ground-based telescopes, but also about space-based telescopes. Now, one of the big reasons to build a telescope is to detect electromagnetic radiation, or light, that our eyes are unable to see. So these next two slides are um, showing us the same object in different wavelengths. And out of these four pictures here, on the left we have near-infrared, which was taken by the McMath-Pierce Solar Telescope, we have an optical image. Optical is another name for visible. We have an ultraviolet image of the sun. Our eyes would not be able to see that wavelength, and we need a spacecraft, the um, Solar Dynamics Observer uh, Observatory, to do so. And then in x-rays, really high energy light, where we are seeing an outer layer of the sun that we'll be talking about in chapter 15. But if we look at all of these different pictures, if the only thing we ever did was take pictures of the sun in regular visible light, there would be so much understanding that we would be missing about what it's really look, what it really is structured like, and what actions and activities are going on at the surface of the sun. This is a set of pictures of the Whirlpool Galaxy going from the lowest energy form of light, the radio on the far left, to the highest energy form of light available for this picture, for the set of pictures, x-rays on the far right. And if we compare each image, except for the x-rays where we don't see a lot of structure, we do see the similarities when we compare, for example, infrared and ultraviolet. But we are being shown different aspects of this galaxy, of this structure. So one of the big reasons to build telescopes is so that we can get all of the different perspectives of any given object and learn everything we can about it and not just what it looks like in regular visible light. This is important to note that what we will be talking about is not just images like the previous two pictures, uh, previous two slides showed us, but also spectra, which we talked about throughout chapter five. The key to getting either an image or a spectrum from an object is we need to collect the light from that object. And there are two different types of telescopes that give us different ways to collect that light. It is really important that we understand the difference between refracting telescopes and reflecting telescopes, those two terms. So refraction, which is used in refracting telescopes, is the physics where light is actually bent when it goes from one material to a different material. So for refracting telescopes specifically, we are using glass lenses, and so the light that has been traveling through the emptiness of space gets to either vacuum, then lens, then um, it's bent that way, or it gets through Earth's atmosphere, now it's traveling through air, and then the glass lens, and then air, um, to get focused that way as well. In either case, the glass itself bends the light, and if light is coming in in parallel lines, as it would for a distant object, it is bent to focus at a single point called the focus. A refracting telescope usually has two of these lenses, there's the primary lens that gives it the designation of a refracting telescope. The primary lens is what's actually focusing the light to a point and collecting it. 
And then it will often have an eyepiece at the back or on the side um, that allows an observer to actually see that image that's being produced um, from the collected light. But the primary lens is what causes it to be called a refracting telescope. Now most of the telescopes that were used to make the observations that we mentioned in chapter 2 and 3 were refracting telescopes. Galileo's original telescopes, all of the ones that he worked with, used lenses, a primary lens at the front of the telescope tube and an eyepiece at the back of the telescope tube, because they really were glorified like spy glasses, like pirate spy glasses. The picture here on the right is the Harvard College Observatory. When it was built, it was the largest refracting telescope of its time, and it's called the Great Refractor, because we're good at naming things. And we see that, again, it's the same kind of shape, a very long extended tube, and to be able to use this, we have somebody looking through an eyepiece at the back of it. Even once we really got to the limits of what we are able to do with refracting telescopes, we still have this extremely elongated shape to it because of the way that lenses work. This is Yerkes Observatory, and we actually only have half of the telescope in this picture here. It was built around 1897, and it had a 40-inch lens. Now, this picture, if we look at all of the people in it, there's actually someone quite famous uh, present here, Albert Einstein, and it kind of helps us get a sense of when this telescope was in use. It is in the somewhat modern era that we are using refracting telescopes, but we've seen all of the pictures up until now were either sketches or black and white photographs. The reason why everything looks so dated is because there are a lot of issues with refracting telescopes. I really like this webcomic from XKCD because it does a really nice job of listing the really key problems with refracting telescopes. They are really expensive to make. To make a lens the correct shape and size is really expensive to manufacture properly. The larger you build the lens across, the longer the telescope tube has to be, and so they are not compact. It is very hard to build these bigger and have them enclosed in a space. There's a phrase here on the webcomic called chromatic aberration that is in our textbook. When light bends by passing from air to glass, that bending of light also separates light into the different colors. We talked about how Isaac Newton sent light through a prism and saw a rainbow. That happens when you use lenses too. And so the red light focuses at a different location than the blue light does, and that's a problem for us. And then this statement of reduced light gathering, we will be talking about the telescope powers in the next video, but what we're basically saying there is it's not possible to build a larger and larger lens at a certain point because it is too expensive and too heavy to support against gravity. Reflecting telescopes, our webcomic tells us, the only big problem with them is we can't see space vampires. Darn. So it's kind of a joke, but it is important to recognize that reflecting telescopes are objectively better when we have mirror technology. Now, the first reflecting telescope was made back in the 1600s by Isaac Newton using polished, smooth tin and copper. But once we actually had mirrors, the way that we're used to seeing them in a bathroom or on our um, dresser, the silver, um, the silver uh, layer on a piece of glass to make a mirror the way that we think of them, that took chemists until the 1800s to figure out. Once we had that technology, astronomy shifted drastically to being able to make much larger and more effective reflecting telescopes. Now, let's think about a mirror briefly. If we had a flat mirror and we uh, had light shining on it, that light would shine and it would bounce off. And if we had a whole bunch of parallel lines coming at that flat mirror, the way that it would for a distant light source, all of those lines would bounce off and they would not focus to a single point. So reflecting telescopes cannot use flat mirrors to do anything. But if we curved the mirror to be like a somewhat bowl shape, 
then we can get them to focus to a single point. So a curved, also known as a concave primary mirror, is able to focus light the same way that a lens would. But instead of having the light travel through the mirror and have problems like chromatic aberration, the light is only reflecting off of it and we don't get those same issues. To get the light out of the telescope tube, we need a small little flat mirror just to bend the light path, but that secondary mirror is not the thing that's actually collecting and focusing the light. The primary mirror does that. There are a lot of different ways that you can get the light out of a reflecting telescope. Notice that in all three of these pictures here, there is a big curved concave primary mirror at the bottom. And then in the prime focus, we don't have a secondary mirror. We would just need to put all of the instrumentation within the telescope tube. And there are a couple of scientific telescopes that use that um, implementation. The Newtonian focus is named because Isaac Newton was the one who first thought of it, was to get the light out of the telescope, we just kind of send it sideways. That's often used in backyard telescopes because you don't want to have to bend down to the bottom of the telescope tube to look through it. But then the Cassegrain focus is one where the light is just bent back out the bottom of the telescope tube, and that is used in a lot of other um, full big scientific observatories so that all of the instrumentation, instrumentation can be down near the floor, easily accessible if we need to fix something or replace something or change it. We don't need to memorize these different names, but it is worth recognizing that the reason why we have reflecting telescopes is because of the big curved primary mirror. And it is really important for us to understand that this is talking about mirrors because we're talking about visible light to begin with. But radio dishes, if we think about satellite dishes or big radio um, dishes for either getting satellite TV or radio or, or anything else that we might see these around, those are using the principles of reflection to collect radio waves into a receiver using a curved dish. It is the same idea, and radio telescopes are reflecting telescopes. So when we compare them side by side, we notice that in both cases we are able to have an eyepiece, we are sending light that was parallel to a single point, that is a focus point, but the reason why reflecting telescopes are better is because we are able to make them much larger without having to have an extremely long telescope tube. And we are able to have a really heavy mirror that we can hold up against um, the force of gravity. A lens, we can only touch the sides of it because we need the light to actually travel through it. Since the 1900s, all major astronomical observatories use the principles of reflection instead of using lenses. So that's where we're going to end our introduction um, video here. The next video is going to go through a whole bunch of kind of highlights of the rest of chapter six. Um, but this is where we really get to the key distinguishing um, features of what we mean by a telescope and the difference between reflection and refraction. So I will see you in that next video.